about you guys, but as I've shared over this last month, big Olympics fan, and um, something that was new for the Olympics this past year, maybe you saw it, was the bell at track and field events. You can throw the picture up on the screen. There's Gabby Douglas. Gabby uh, won a couple of events for Team USA, and at the end of the event, if you won the event and got the gold medal, you got to, you got to ring the bell, right? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool experience. Some of you, I know, looking up here, are very jealous of me right now as I'm ringing this bell, as I felt very jealous of those athletes who are ringing the bell. It was cool, and, and the reason, though, it was a new thing for the Olympics this year has everything to do with the city that it was held in. So as you know, the Olympics were in Paris, France, and uh, five years prior to the Olympics in 2019, you may have remembered that Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral had a terrible fire and it burned most of the building down. They're already in the process of restoring it, and the fire took place. And so now they're continuing to restore it, and um, some of the bells that were in the big bell clock tower there at the cathedral were destroyed. So this new bell was created not only for the Olympics, but when the restoration process is complete, they will put that Olympic bell with the Olympic logo inside of the cathedral. See, for us as Americans and other countries around the world, it was like, oh, this is just cool. Like, I love watching them do that. It's, USA, USA. Like, right? That's what it was for us. But for the people of France, the bell, it was a symbol of hope. It was an object of restoration. It was an object of reminding them that, hey, what had been burned down was going to be brought back to life. Redemption was going to happen for the people in Paris. You know, this morning as we continue in our series, Step Up, there is a specific object that the people of Israel had that not only reminded them of God's presence with them, but it was an object of hope. It was an object of restoration. It was an object of knowing and reminding them that God was going to redeem them out of Egyptian slavery and out through the wilderness and going to give them the land that he had promised to them many, many years prior. And as we look at this object and the meaning of it for them, our hope and our prayer for me, for all of us, is that we would be reminded of God's presence in our life. That we would be reminded of the redemptive work that he wants to continue to do in all of our lives as we enter into this season in our culture and in our society today. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 3. That's where we're going to be at this morning. If you're grabbing a Bible in the seat back in front of you, it's going to be on page 171. 171. If you uh, don't have a Bible, at the end of the service today, we'd love for you to take home a Bible as a gift from our church to you. There are English Bibles. There are Spanish Bibles. They're on the back wall of our auditorium. I want to make sure that you grab it and take it home as a gift from our church to you. And as you're turning there to Joshua chapter 3, just want to remind you once again that here at Avenue, we're going to teach from God's Word every week because we believe God has primarily spoken to us through His Word. And not only do we believe God's Word is the Bible, and that's true, but that it's very applicable to our lives today. So Joshua chapter 3, where we've been at this entire month in this series, Step Up, is looking at Joshua leading the Israelites into the Promised Land. They had spent 400 years in Egyptian slavery, 40 years in the wilderness, and now they're finally getting to experience the land God had promised to them generations ago. And where we're going this morning is we're seeing them finally get to that place, to cross over into the promised land. We've seen how God called Joshua first and foremost to individual obedience, and how we are called to individually pursue God in our own life. And then on top of that, we are called to not only pursue individual obedience for ourselves, but that that individual obedience would bless those around us and the importance of us staying connected and unified as a church family in this season. And then last week, we talked about the story of Rahab. And even though she wasn't an Israelite, she displayed sacrifice and she was willing to serve and put the needs of others above her own. And in doing so, that impacted generations and generations, not only in her family, but as we realized as people who are following Jesus, it impacted us as well. So now we're, we're there, we're getting to the promised land. Joshua's about to lead the Israelites into the land. God was ready to give to his people. So Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. 
early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shidom and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. So we see here in verse 3 and 4 that the symbol of, or the object is not a bell, but it's called the ark of the covenant. And we can throw a picture on the screen of what this looks like. You see those priests are carrying this big golden chest. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was three different things that reminded the people of God's presence with them, as well as God's redemptive work in their life, his faithfulness to them always. And so the first was the Ten Commandments. Those those big stone tablets that God gave to Moses on top of the mountain, brought them down, all the Ten Commandments that we know of today— Big tablet inside the Ark of the Covenant. Reminder, hey, you're supposed to obey me in this way if you're going to experience life to the full in the promised land. So we have the Ten Commandments. Secondly, we have what's called manna. And what manna is, literally, it's a phrase that means, what is it? (laughs) So if the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, God provided food from heaven every day for them. And he would send down this bread-like substance, and it was called manna, because the Israelites looked at it on the ground. They said, well, what is it? (laughs) And that's where it's got its name. And God would provide for them every single day. So there was a little bit of manna that was in there. How it did not rot out or get disgusting, well, it's miraculous. God had, had sustained it as the one who provided for them. Last thing that was in there was a staff. And it was a staff that was used by Moses as well as Aaron when they were talking to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go and let's get out of Egypt. And Moses would use it for miracles. He'd throw it on the ground, it turned into a snake. He'd put it in the water, it turned to blood. And then when they crossed the Red Sea, if you remember, Moses had it up top and he put it down, the the waters parted. See, these three things inside this ark were a continual reminder to the people of Israel. God is with you. God is for you. God has not forsaken you. He has not abandoned you. And he is going to continue to redeem and restore your life and your people. Not because of anything good that they've done. All because of God's goodness and faithfulness to them. So at the end of verse 4, we see that the Israelites, though, are supposed to stay pretty far away, about 2,000 feet, says, you know, amount of cubits, about 900 meters, 2,000 feet away. See, as the Israelites would travel throughout the wilderness and getting close to the promised land, the the Ark of the Covenant was in the middle of the people. So you'd have some of the leaders in the front, some of the tribes in back. This time now, God is telling Joshua and the Israelites that Ark of the Covenant needs to go out in front because the people need to see that I am the one that am leading them. That it's not going to be the people leading, but that God himself, God's presence, is going to lead the people across the Jordan so that they can enjoy the land that he had promised to them. So we continue on now in verse 5 as the story continues, and here's what it says. Joshua then told the people, consecrate yourself. Consecrate, word saying, hey, set yourself apart. Most likely what's taking place is the day before they go and cross the Jordan River, they're going to have a fast. They're going to pray. They're going to abstain from physical food and physical pleasure in order to grow spiritual hunger. Okay, so consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua then said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and they went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel, so that they know that I am with you as I was with Moses. So tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now, we understand God has called Joshua to lead and the people are ready to go, but this command here in verse 8 is a little bit different than how the Israelites have seen God work before. You know, it was about 40 years ago, what happened? Moses stood up, he puts the staff down, the seas part, and then the people walk. 
Now, what God is telling these priests who are carrying this really heavy Ark of the Covenant, hey, I need you to stand and begin to step into the Jordan River. It's a little bit different than God has worked before, but God is still redeeming, is still restoring, is still renewing, even though his directions and his leader is someone different. And so now the people have a choice. Are they going to continue to follow Joshua just like they followed Moses, which ultimately points them to following God? Or are they going to start to worry, start to get concerned? Are they going to step up or are they going to step back? Continues on, verse 9, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here, listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. You see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priest who carried the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So a lot going on here. First off, we see verse 10. You have these different people groups. Those are the people that are in the territory, in the promised land. God is going to give the Israelites success and victory over them. And then verse 11, verse 12, we see God say, hey, make sure Ark of the Covenant, it's ahead. But then there's these 12 men, one from each tribe. They have a special role. We're actually not going to learn about their special role today, but next week when we wrap up our Step Up series, we'll learn a little bit more about their role and why these 12 men were important as the Israelites moved forward. And then verse 13, once again, says, hey, you're going to step into the Jordan River and once you take that first step, the waters upstream are going to stop flowing. Now, I, I'm going to read the rest of the story here, and we're going to see God work in a miraculous way. And then I want to come back to this portion and a little bit after it, because there's some geographical as well as some historical things that we need to understand in order to know the significance of the faith that was displayed by the Israelites and the faith that God is calling you and I to have today. So look with me, verse 14, we're going to finish up this chapter. It says this, So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest, which is where they're at right now. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a tall town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, which that's the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and they stood on dry ground. Why all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. A lot going on here. We're going to throw a map up on the screen. Hopefully this just sheds some light, brings to light what's happening in these five verses. So you, you see there, there's a red circle right in the middle. We know that that's where the Israelites were at. And they were going from the east to the west. So from the right side of your screen to the left side of the screen. They were crossing that blue line that goes all the way down. That's the Jordan River. And they were going to go over to the city of Jericho. Then you see a blue circle up a ways. That is where the water stopped flowing at a town called Adam near Zarethan. And the distance, as you can see on the screen, between where the water stopped flowing and to where they were at was 15 miles, give or take a mile. Okay, so the Jordan River, I want you to picture, is similar to the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River flows from Canada all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. It flows from the north and to the south. The Jordan River does the same thing. And it's flowing. This is a time of year, it says it's in harvest season. So it's flowing so fast that it's overflowing onto the edge. So as the, the, the Levites, the priests, are stepping up with this huge Ark of the Covenant, water is coming out over onto them, onto their legs, uh, maybe up to their hips. We don't know how much it's splashing up, but it's, it's there. It's rushing, okay? They're not stepping into this river similar to how we would step into Lake Michigan, right? 
You step in Lake Michigan, there's a sandbar, and you just you go nice and easy, and the waves come up, and you kind of go up a little bit because you don't want to get too cold yet, and then you take another step, and you're like, oh, I don't want to get too cold yet, and then finally you, 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 you go, you know, chest in, you're like, okay, I can go, and, and oh, it's still very cold, but the sandbar's still there, and so I can move back a little bit. It's nice and peaceful, it's nice and easy. Yes, it's still cold. If you don't think it's cold, you're crazy. Okay, Lake Michigan is cold water, all right? And so it's nice and peaceful. That's not what's happening here. The waters are flowing. Some of you want to go drive out to the Mississippi River today, take a couple of hours, try to get in at the water's edge. See how that is, especially if the river is high. Where they're stepping in, probably right at the edge, is around three to four feet right away. And they have to get into the water, all of them, just a little bit at a time. So at some point, these priests, these Levites, are carrying this huge Ark of the Covenant, and they're standing in this water that is raging, that is roaring, and they're probably, I would say, at least belly high. You know, I'm, I'm almost six foot. I'll never be over six foot unless I pick out my hair a little bit, okay? So then I get to like six one. It's great. When I go to the doctor, they always put that thing on that smashes my hair. It's embarrassing. I can't be over six foot. But anyway, so picture half of me, right? And they're in there and they're holding on this thing and the water's raging against them. The water is rushing against them. And back behind them is nearly two million people who are waiting for God to do something miraculous. Who are waiting for God to show up. They're ready, they're ready to see, hey, we remember how the Red Sea split, right? The waters just parted immediately, and then we went right through. This time, they're standing there, and they're like, uh, nothing's happening. <laughs> uh, still nothing's happening. The water's continue to rage and go harder and faster. And these guys, these priests, they're getting tired and it's heavy. And are they going to fall? What's going to happen? Is God going to come through? And this whole time, they just have to wait. And yet at the exact same time that they step into the water and all these priests get in, 15 miles upstream, God has dammed up the water. He stopped the water to flow down the Jordan River. And what's so fascinating about what happens here is that over the last 1,000 years in our world's history, from about 1,100 to, to where we're at today, six different times there's been archaeological evidence in which around this area up near Adam, near Zarephan, that there was an earthquake that took place that created a landslide that actually dammed up the water there at the Jordan River so that it stopped flowing into the Dead Sea. It, it happened two times in the last 100 years. I want to make sure I get these years right. 1927 and in 1906. Earthquake happened, landslide happened, the water stopped flowing for 24 hours. 1834, it stopped for two days. 1534, it stopped for half a day. 1267 and 1160 AD, it stopped for anywhere between four and six hours. Go Google it today. Do some research on it. It's fascinating to see how that has taken place over these last thousand years. And it's exactly what we see taking place here in the story today. Why do I bring that up? Well, God didn't necessarily do this amazing miracle where he parted the waters and he stood them up and they he worked through the order of creation. There's something that naturally has taken place and continues to take place in our culture, in our society, in our world today. Now, is God in sovereign in control of the universe? He is the creator of heavens and earth? Absolutely. Did he ordain for it to happen this way? 110% he did. He said, hey, as soon as you take that step in, the waters are going to stop. But I don't know about you, but I imagine that it would take quite a bit of time <laughs> for 15 miles of water to finally dry up. Now, the Jordan, Jordan River is a pretty large river. It's about 17 feet deep at its deepest point in the middle of the river. It's going to take some time for that water to stop going. And that whole time, the Israelites are just there waiting and waiting and waiting. And yet, God was at work upstream. He was already doing something miraculous that they couldn't see. And yet, by faith, they had to step up and believe that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. 
You see, for us today in our society, our fast-paced, instant gratification culture that we live in today, there are many times when we talk about stepping up in our faith. We talk about, as we talked about these last few weeks, hey, we want to build these rhythms and habits of being with Jesus and becoming like Jesus. We want to get connected into community. We want to grow closer to one another. We want to serve and sacrifice and have an impact on those around us. So many times we do those things, and we do those things faithfully and consistently, but after a while, it feels mundane. I'm going through the motions, or I'm not really getting a lot out of it. Or we've talked about this cultural moment that we're in today in which our, our culture over these last eight years many times has been starved of hope and truth and love and kindness. And we as a church family have an opportunity to offer that to them. And yet we start to do these things and practice these disciplines and try to build these relationships and we don't see anything come of it. Or maybe... You've been at church for a while. You've been going to church. Well, maybe you come back to church for the first time and you're like, I've, I've tried to read this scripture. I've tried to get into God's word. I've tried to listen to him in prayer. I, it just doesn't seem to work. I, can't, I don't have the secret sauce. It's not happening. And what God is reminding us today is that even when we are obedient and we don't see the results, please, please don't believe that he's not working. That some of the best work that he can do in my life and your life happens in the mundane. It happens in the simple steps of obedience. Because all he's doing is saying, hey, I need you to take one step into that water and I'm going to start to work. I need you to take one step up this fall and get connected and build some disciplines and grow close to other people and get involved in a group or go into rooted, whatever it is. I'm just asking you to take one step of faith and I'm going to start working. See, when we take that one step of faith, we position ourselves to see God at work in our lives. But so many of us, we give up. We quit. We say, oh, I've tried that before and it didn't work. I stood in the water and the water just kept going and going and life got more difficult and I tried to make this decision to have integrity at work and I tried to make this decision to rebuild a relationship and I tried to make this decision to honor God and the waters just kept going and the waves kept crashing and I knew God was with me and his Holy Spirit's inside of me but nothing seems to be changing so I stepped back and I stepped away and all God wanted you to do was to stay in it and stay faithful. See, if there's one thing that you and I can pull out of this message today, it's our big idea for the morning. It's this. Church family, it's time to step up in faith. It's time to step up in faith. It's time for us as a church to step into the Jordan and watch God work. Because the work that he's going to do individually in you the work that he's going to do when you're in community with other people, the work that he's going to do when you make that decision to sacrifice and to serve and to give up time and treasure and talent, not only for yourselves, but for the good of others, just stay in it. Believe that God is working in you and through you. And even though you can't see the work that he's doing upstream, you better believe that soon enough the waters are going to dry out. And you're going to be able to take that next step into the land that God has called you to go into, whatever that may be in your life. We're physically not going into a new land. I get that. But spiritually, there are seasons in our life where the waves are crashing that we talked about earlier. It feels like we're drowning in it. And God's saying, hey, just, just stay there. Stay faithful and watch me work. And so what does that look like for us? We've been talking about it all month. There's different ways that we can step up. The first one is to step up individually. Step up individually. And we do that by what? Staying rooted in rhythms that produce spiritual fruit. We talked all this past year about rooted and practicing these spiritual disciplines of prayer and worship and Bible reading, sacrificial generosity and building community and, and worship. These rhythms... Just like when you come to church on a Sunday morning, you're in this rhythm, and sometimes you're like, oh, I'm connected, and it felt great. And other times you're like, I didn't even hear anything. <laughs> I did it. I mean, Kyle was talking the whole time, and it sounded like, wah, 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 right? That happens. And sometimes we just got to stay in it. We got to stay in these rhythms. We got to stay in these habits. 
Because we know when we do that, we position ourselves to watch God work in our lives. And so what are you doing individually this fall to do that? If you've never been through Rooted at our church, I'd love for you to join me and others as we go through Rooted starting on Tuesday, September 10th. And we talk about developing these rhythms and these habits to be with and become like Jesus. But we're also called to, to oh, you can find out more information about that. Go throw up on the screen, avenuechristian.com slash rooted. You can find out more information about that. The second one is how we're called to step up together. To step up together. And how do we do that? We do that by what? Connecting in a life group or a Bible study. Being with other people. And sometimes it's so hard for us to make that decision because I've been in a life group before and I've been in a small group and I've done a Bible study and I didn't connect with that person. I didn't get a lot out of it. And then other people weren't showing up and I was putting more effort into it than they were. And God's like, hey, it's not about you. (laughs) It's not about what you get out of it, but it's about you being present and allowing God to work. And as he uses you to connect and help others stay unified, you then too receive the blessing of being connected with other people who are gonna pray for you who are going to encourage you, who are going to be there for you when you're going through your stuff, just like you're going to be there for them when they're going through their stuff. And we'd love for you to get connected this fall in a group. And you can find out about all of our groups and all information on our website, avenchristian.com slash connect. And the last one, like we talked about last week, is to step up sacrificially. Step up sacrificially to give of our time and our talent and our treasure, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. And we can do that by what? By serving inside the walls or outside the walls of our church. We're gonna be talking about mission partners all this school year, every month, and Caring Network, we've been talking about this past month. We'll be learning more about some food pantries that we support in the community this next month. There's going to be different opportunities for you to learn more and to say, hey, is there one opportunity outside my church in which I can step up and serve and sacrifice to benefit those around me? But even inside the walls of our church, I asked some staff and volunteers this week, I said, hey, what are some top needs that you have within your ministry that you can help more and more people find new life in Christ? And here were some of the top needs listed, some serving opportunities here inside of our church family. Within our missions team that meets and helps promote, we're looking for someone who has a global mission mindset focus as we look to expand and and, and reach out and support mission work that is getting the gospel into the, the far reaches of the world. We're looking for someone who has a passion for that, has a desire for that. Here on our on our stage, we're looking for people who can play drums and play the piano. So when someone gets sick or someone can't be here, we want to have extra people in the bullpen, people who can utilize those skills. All right, we're looking in kids' ministry for elementary teachers and leaders and preschool teachers and leaders and student ministry. We're looking for people specifically who can invest in students' lives on Sunday nights for high schoolers and Wednesday nights for middle schoolers. We have a ministry called Golden Grace that connects and cares for people who are widowed or or widowers and or maybe in their upper 80s and that age range. We just want to love on those people in our church. And maybe you have a spot in your heart that really you desire to reach out to them and love on those people in that stage of life. Maybe that's God's calling you to do that. We're also looking for people to serve behind the scenes. Some of you are like, hey, I'm going to serve. Just don't make me get in front of anyone, all right? We have those opportunities for setting up stuff on Sunday morning like coffee or doing stuff throughout the week to help keep our building up. Like yesterday, many of you were here getting stuff set up and cleaned up for our fall kickoff today. You're like, hey, I'll do that 10 times out of 10. Just don't put me on stage and let people know I'm doing it, all right? That's why. That's okay. There are many opportunities that allow us to serve other people so that it can be a blessing to those around. So I don't know where the Lord has for you in this season. But there's one more thing I want to share. Is that, and I've talked about these last couple weeks, is that for some of you here, God is calling you to step up and lead. God has placed a burden on your heart to not just be a part of a ministry that's already existing, but to maybe lead something. Not just say, hey, I want to go to Rooted, but hey, I want to be trained so I can lead Rooted, so I can help more and more people develop these rhythms. 
hey, I, I not only just want to serve with a mission partner, but I want to learn how I can step up and lead and be active in participating in it and helping other people get involved in it as well. Hey, I don't want to just be in a, a Bible study with women or a, a men's group, but I want to lead one of those groups. See, for some of you here today, it's time for you to remind yourself that God's presence in you isn't just for you, but God's presence in you is so that others would see their need for Jesus. That as you step up and lead in a way, God will be faithful. There's some of you, hey, we're back here. We're waiting for those priests to take step forward. And we're going to wait. And that's hard. And that's difficult. But we're going to get moving. Some of you, you need to be the ones that take the step into the water's edge first. And over these last few years, we have seen different groups of people do that here in our church. They have seen needs that need to be met in our community and beyond. And they said, you know what? I'm not going to point to the church and say, oh, I hope the church does this. And let me tell Pastor Kyle that he needs to get something going so that we meet this need. They said, hey, can, I'm going to step up and do it. Is that okay? Absolutely. You know why? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. It talks about pastors, evangelists, all these people who are leaders in the church. What are we called to do? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. My number one job is to equip you so that you can live out your purpose and your calling in life so that you can embrace the new life that Jesus has for you. And together, we can help others experience new life in him as well. So I think back coming out of COVID and a group of people decided to partner with some other churches and something Blossom called Community Kitchen that you'll hear more about next week. And they're serving meals daily and consistently to people here in the Downers Grove area. I think about the people who um, started to minister justice and brought a gospel justice center here to our church. And they've helped dozens and dozens upon dozens of people who are experiencing injustices in their life and legal issues in their life. And they've served and supported and spiritually cared for them during these last few years. Or I think about prior to COVID, there's a group of people that got connected with an organization called Safe Families. And they said, hey, we see what they're doing and we want to be trained up to make sure that families can stay together. That when parents are going through difficult times, we can help them by taking their kids, giving them a safe spot so their parents can get back on their feet and be reunited because we value the family unit that God has designed for us to thrive in. And over time, more and more people got involved and it was like, we got to get out of the way. God's doing a great work in here. We better get behind, get out of the way and get behind it and keep serving and keep giving resources and, and people and money to it so that it can continue to be a blessing to those in need. Some of you, God put something on your heart. Maybe it's tears, maybe it's something we've talked about today, but maybe it's something different. So step up, lead. You know, in a moment, we're going we're gonna to take a time to take communion together, to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us, the thing that makes all of this even possible. And one of our ministry leaders and deacons, Lauren Larson, is going to lead us in taking communion today. But after our time of reflection, in which I believe God's Spirit, through God's Word, is speaking to you, is helping you hear what He has to say, I believe that He's calling each and every one of us to step up in some way this fall. And after service, when we go outside, there's going to be a tent out there. So after you get your food, you're going to see a tent. It's our step-up tent. And there's going to be a bell here. And if you go over there and you sign up or you step up or you get connected, you do something, that bell's going to be there. And you're going to ring it. And you're going to ring it loud. Like you just won the gold medal. Because none of us are probably ever going to win a gold medal in here, okay? So that's fine. But like, you're going to ring it loud. Why? Because you're stepping up to the call that God has for you right now in this season, whatever it is. So when I'm out there and I'm dunking on kids and the inflatables over there, I want to hear this thing, all right? I want to hear it going. I want to hear more and more people stepping up this fall. So let us take a moment now. Let's put the loud bell away so we can reflect quietly for a moment. And let's ask God to speak to us. The thoughts that he's putting in your mind right now, believe that, that that's God speaking to you. Take a moment just to silently reflect, to pray, 
ask God to help you take that next step up today. And after we're done reflecting and being quiet, I will pray, and then Lauren will lead us in taking communion together. So let's take some time to listen to God right now. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us this morning. Help us to remember and honor and celebrate the work that you've done for us on the cross. Thank you that you are restoring and redeeming and making all things new because of your death and your resurrection and your Holy Spirit's power in our lives. Challenge us to step up today, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen.